From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host David Feldman. Hello, David. Good morning. Good morning. We also have the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, this is going to be a jolting program. Get ready for it, listeners. A very jolting program. And on today's show, we welcome the Reverend Graylin Hagler, who is senior pastor of Plymouth United Church of Christ in Washington, D.C., a longtime social justice advocate. Reverend Hagler is going to tell us about the Poor People's Campaign, which was inspired by the work of the late Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., Economic justice, social justice, ecological justice, all of these things affect the poor in ways the rest of us may find hard to imagine. And Reverend Hagler is going to talk to us about that in the first half of the show. In the second half, we welcome back constitutional scholar Bruce Fine, who is going to give us his take on Donald Trump's pick for the Supreme Court, Brett Kavanaugh. Regular listeners will remember Mr. Fine from previous episodes when he pulled no punches and described how Congress has abdicated its responsibility to declare war and that Bush, Cheney, Obama, and Hillary Clinton, according to the Constitution, technically could be tried as war criminals. More recently, he argued that John Bolton should not be named National Security Advisor to President Trump and how that position, which has become so powerful, should be subject to Senate approval like other cabinet positions. We're interested in his take on Kavanaugh's reported deference to executive power especially in light of the Mueller investigation. As usual, somewhere in the middle, we'll duck out for a minute to the National Press Building in Washington, D.C. to get the latest from our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But now our next guest speaks for those at the lower end of the economic ladder. David? Reverend Graylin Hagler is a senior pastor of Plymouth United Church of Christ in Washington, D.C. A longtime social justice advocate, Reverend Hagler is the chairperson of Faith Strategies, a collective of clergy who consult, advise, and organize to help bring social justice issues into the faith community. A big part of that work is the Poor People's Campaign, which was inspired by the vision of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The Poor People's Campaign fights for voting rights and economic justice and against ecological devastation and military aggression, all of which hurt poor people the most. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Reverend Graylin Hagler. Thank you, David. It's good to be here. Thank you, Graylin. I remember the first Poor People's Campaign. I was in Washington, and they set up Resurrection City, an encampment right near the Washington Monument. And there was great press, and people learned that a lot of Americans are poor. And what happened since, there is a war on poverty under Lyndon Johnson, and there have been a lot of programs. But what's happened is that the rich have gotten richer. And the arena of poverty has been taken off the national news TV. They don't like to talk about poor people's plights. And before we get to your leading role among other leaders in the clergy, including Reverend Barber from North Carolina, who started Moral Monday in North Carolina some years ago, I just want to bring our listeners a little bit up to date on the serious problem of poverty. This comes from two reports, a Federal Reserve survey that just came out and a new United Way report. And listen to this. 40% of American adults don't have enough savings to cover a $400 emergency expense, such as unexpected medical bill, car problem, or home repair. 43% of households can't afford the basics to live meaning they aren't earning enough to cover the combined costs of housing, food, child care, health care, transportation, and a cell phone, according to the United Way study. More than a quarter of all adults skipped necessary medical care last year because they couldn't afford it. 22% of adults aren't able to pay all their bills every month. And only 38% of non-retired Americans think their retirement savings is on track. Those are statistics. There are real people behind them. The poor die more than other people because they can't afford health care or they're working in dangerous circumstances, etc. They pay more because they're ripped off more in the marketplace. 
look at the economic exploitation in the low-income areas in our cities. And to describe a resurgence, the Poor People's Campaign of 2018, we have Reverend Graylin Hagler, who was a community leader of such repute in Boston years ago, before he moved to Washington, that when he said he was going to move to Washington, it was a page one story on the cover of the Boston Globe. So tell us about the Poor People's Campaign and how in Washington, D.C., you can go to jail for praying. <laughs> That's a good story. Let me say one thing, because over the years, particularly, the extremists have been very successful in racializing poverty. When I say racializing poverty, to make sure that folks believe in the United States that those who are poor are black, when in fact you got more white folks who are impoverished than black folks simply because they make up the bulk of the population. But the reality is, is when most people think of like issues around welfare or issues around poverty or issues even around homelessness, it is always characterized racially, and that means that those who are that 1% are able to get away with stealing even more because people, in a sense, decide that it really doesn't include them when we talk about the issues of poverty and people being disenfranchised and marginalized. So one of the things that the Poor People's Campaign is trying to do is trying to open up a vision of what poverty really looks like, that it really covers every single sector and racial group in the society. And also, you know, you're still talking about a majority of white people being impoverished and unable to afford health care and unable to afford some of the basic human rights. And so it's really to the advantage of those who do not, in a sense, want to share the resources to racialize it because you're playing into that old paradigm of racism that exists in the United States that somehow, if it's only black, if it's only Latino or brown, then all the rest don't have to be concerned about it when, in fact, that is a lie. All you have to do is go to West Virginia to prove your point, of course, overwhelmingly white state in overwhelmingly right. impoverished situation. And that's why, and just think of it, that's why people, when you talked about even the Affordable Care Act, people basically said, well, I like the Affordable Care Act, but I can't stand that Obamacare. Well, tell us what the Poor People's Campaign is, who's involved, are they leading the way to a $15 minimum wage, which is a rather simple partial fix for very impoverished people in this country, among many other proposals. Give us an idea of the street protests and how you were handcuffed and sent to jail recently in Washington, D.C. So one of the things that we were engaged in was particularly mass meetings, and we're doing that again, mass meetings on Sunday night in order to educate people about what the issues were that we were focused on this week and then take to the street on Monday in direct action here in Washington, D.C. It was focused on sort of the federal instrumentalities in other states. It was focused on state bodies, state legislative bodies at, that people took to the streets. And so there were mass arrests all across the country. And here in, in Washington, D.C., the day that the Supreme Court made its decision that Ohio could purge its voting rolls, nine of us, nine faith leaders, basically prayed in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, and we were told that we could not pray there. And though we continued to pray, we ended up being arrested and spent 28 hours in custody for praying in front of the Supreme Court over the issue of voting rights and voter suppression that continues to be issue in the country. And so the Poor People's Campaign is focused on voter suppression, systemic racism, ecological devastation. Of course, when we talk about the whole economics of $15 an hour to fight for 15 and we realize that even that in places like Washington, D.C., you still can't live. But it's basically trying to open up the issues and focus on the fact that we put in all this money into militarism, and in fact, we gave more to the military budget than the military even asked for in this last budgetary exercise. Tens uh, of billions of dollars more. That's right, and that means that also the social structures suffer, just like it always suffered, because we can't find money for health care. We can't find money for affordable housing, but we always can find money for a bomb, a missile, a bullet, that type of stuff. You know, the proposals dealing with poverty are not all that off the wall. I mean, Western Europe essentially has abolished poverty as we know it in our inner cities and elsewhere. There's really very little abject poverty in Western Europe. Canada has done a much better job than we have. Australia, New Zealand, 
Recently, there was an article in the Washington Post that asked some experts what single proposal would they advance to end inequality in America. I never liked that word inequality because that's a cover word for exploitation of labor by the rich and powerful like Walmart and the uh, people who run the tomato growing areas in Florida and, and elsewhere. But here's what some of them came up with. One expert said, to deal with poverty, a massive expansion of local housing stock. Another one said universal access to child care funded by a tax on capital, like a Wall Street transaction tax. Another one said a big boost to union rights, universal social wealth fund. Another one said create a trust for every American baby. Benjamin Franklin would have liked that. Another one said pick up the antitrust stick and wield it. In other words, break up these big monopolies and the big banks that are too big to fail and they fall on the backs of ordinary taxpayers to bail them out. Another one said dramatically expand Social Security. Another expert said give every American a federal savings account. Another said rein in Wall Street crackdown on white-collar crime. And another one said a national infrastructure program funded by the 1% of the richest people. And as we know, the 1% control huge proportions of the wealth in this country, and the 1% every year get over 20% of the income, but they have a much higher percentage of the wealth because they pile it up and they don't pay that much in taxation. So the problem is you've had these marches, Reverend Hagler, and the press has not really covered them very much. I think the Times has had a couple articles, the Washington Post may. But in the 1960s, it was on national TV. It was all over the newspapers. What do you think the difference is? We don't want to well, hear about it. One of the differences is we've, we've had a centralization of media, a concentration of media. We talk about sort of financial conglomerates. We can talk about media conglomerates. And so basically, the corporate media is less than it was in 1968, and less competition, therefore, and less need to cover stories that are out there because they're basically competing with themselves. And so when you go and you march, I mean, the whole point of marching across the country was to begin to try to change the narrative, to make sure that the voices of the poor could not be ignored any longer, that it would be a news story that would rise on basically any of the wire services out there. And to some extent that happened. But really, you know, right here inside the Beltway, we exist in a bubble where if it doesn't come from Capitol Hill, it doesn't come from the White House, it doesn't come from the State Department, it doesn't exist. It's almost as if neighborhoods have never existed in Washington, D.C. There was some localized press in various other states, but again, sort of as far as a real national news story, it was missed. It was missed because we are just basically dealing with a handful of media outlets in terms of corporate and mainline media. It's more than that, too. I mean, you had thousands of people in Washington, D.C. when you were arrested, for example, and you had four local TV stations who put out a lot of dribble day after day, and they usually like street action, and they didn't cover you in the evening news, even at the local level. I mean, this is when the police, all they had to do was give you a citation. Instead, they tore off your vestments. They handcuffed you. They sent you to prison in shackles. You spent 28 hours in horrible prison conditions seeing what other prisoners are kept in. And still that wasn't news. So I think there's something going on. And I think the people who are writing about the criminalization of poverty have got a very strong point. Can you elaborate on that? Well, let me just think about this, Ralph. I mean, seriously, I mean, if you talk about sort of the bankers and the financers and folks who control money, and there's a relationship between them and the media. And clearly, you know, the kinds of movements that take place on the streets are not covered simply because they don't want that message to go out there. I mean, if we look at even, I mean, the, the fact is, is Occupy created some ripples across the country. It was seen across the country. But nothing has been really seen since then except Black Lives Matter because they were disrupting traffic and airways and shopping centers and all of those type of things. And also, remember, it plays back into that fear, that fear of the 
uprising of black and brown masses that creates panic and fear and therefore is able to sell because media basically operates on fear in this country. I can just point to, we, you can go out and you can do something very serious around talking about eliminating poverty. It doesn't get covered. But if something bleeds, it leads on TV. It leads on the radio. That's what we're up against in, in terms of trying to get messages out, particularly trying to go through an economic and financial wall that exists as media. It's even true on public radio and PBS. Did public radio and PBS cover your marches? Only to the extent that you had Amy Goodman. Amy Goodman was there in the midst of it all, and she covered it, but that was it. That's for Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman, which is not public radio and public TV. It's largely a network of community stations right. like the Pacifica Station. Here's an example of the criminalization of poverty. This comes from the Washington Post. The headline, more than 7 million people may have lost their driver's license because of traffic debt. In other words, if they can't pay the traffic tickets or appear in court to respond to such tickets, they get their driver's license suspended. Jeez, how do they get to work? And uh, that's, right. I mean, that's, that's an example just, of punishing the poor. Right. Remember Ferguson. Remember the thing that got uncovered in Ferguson is that all of the policing that was taking place in Ferguson, the reality is, is that it was basically an all-white police department patrolling basically an all-black community and began to realize that the support of that police department was basically on infractions and tickets that were written in that community that impoverished that community even further that funded a police department and law enforcement to basically oppress them. It's an insidious system. And here's another thing that's all over the country and it should be alerting our law schools to some reality. And it was illustrated by San Francisco, which actually had a reform. And they're the first jurisdiction in the country to stop charging people fees when they're subjected to the criminal justice system. So they passed an ordinance unanimously that eliminated fees for probation, electronic monitoring, and jail booking. So it was a quote by someone in the government who said, quote, these fines, fees, and penalties can trap people in a cycle of debt, and low-income people and people of color are often hit the hardest. That was the end quote. That came out of the ordinance. And it continues saying, quote, under this system, government becomes a driver of inequality, end quote. And to give it even further illustration, it 48 states increased their justice system fees since 2010. So, for, for example, they will add $390 in fees to a $100 fine for running a red light. So Americans leaving prison today can own an average of $13,000 in fines and fees. So that's another example of low-income people falling into a trap. How about the payday loan rackets and the rent-to-own rackets? Describe that and how it impacts poor people. That's a serious issue. We got rid of them out of Washington, D.C., but it was a serious issue in Washington, D.C., and we won that battle out of a great struggle because basically you begin to realize that the politicians don't want to touch it. Don't want to touch it because the payday lenders are able to spread around a lot of money to the politicians because they make a lot of money. One of the people that I ran into in Washington, D.C. here that passed on information as we were picketing it was basically a district manager and was told that they needed to close the store if the store did not net at least $2 million annually. Net, that is. Profit, that's not that's after salaries and all. So when you're really talking about it, you're talking about a sort of a gross infusion of capital that comes off of poor folks. And so it's fees, that, and that's the way they try to get around it. They say, oh, it's not interest rates we're charging, but we're charging fees for the usage of the money. And that's not an interest rate, so you can't write it up as an interest rate, because if you write it up as an interest rate, you're at 500 percent, sometimes 1,000 percent, and people are caught on that treadmill. And in fact, you know, when we were dealing with that, basically there was a manual that I saw that said, well, if you, you go and you try to particularly get seniors or those who are on fixed income that receive a check at the first of the month, and basically you write them up a loan and you try to hold them in check, and so you try to go into their account at the middle of the month so the check will bounce and they will be forced back in to get another payday loan to cover the check because in all of these entities you've got to post date a check, which is technically illegal, but that's what happens. And so they've been protected by politicians. They've been protected over and over again by politicians. Well, I know they had tried in Virginia after we won the case to try to get a ban on payday lenders there. No, it didn't happen. No politician was interested. 
Maryland, you've got even title loans that take place, and no politician is interested in, in limiting it because so much money passes hands. Well, you know, the real corporate crime wave in America is the corporate crime wave. Right. The crime That's wave right. of the, these people with their mortgage rackets during the crash in Wall Street, the Wall Street criminality. They transfer the cost of the bailout to ordinary folks. They unemploy 8 million people in the crash in Wall Street. As we speak, there are dozens of executives, Reverend Hagler, who are making $20,000 an hour. An hour. In other words, the head of Walmart, who makes only $12,000 an hour, before he even goes to lunch on January 2, has made more than any one of one million Walmart workers. So we're talking here of more than medieval disparities among the rich and the poor. And how do the rich get rich? Well, they, they rig the government. They rig the tax system. They have the government develop massive subsidies, handouts, giveaways, so forth. And for a fraction of all this corporate welfare and this bloated military budget that can go into the public health sphere and for cents on the dollar save billions of dollars of health care costs and save millions of lives and injuries and prevent disease. I mean, just a modest reallocation of our taxpayer budget, instead of subsidizing the rich, getting the rich off welfare, getting the corporations off welfare, and redirecting it. So how can any of these politicians say they love America? How can they say they're patriotic in Congress and the White House? It's total nonsense. You can't love America if you hate so many Americans. And greed and power is the coin of the realm. And that's we it. It's, it's greed. It's greed that exists. One of the things that you can get away with it if you trick people in looking at the wrong things and looking in the wrong direction or having a fantasy hope. I'll never forget this. It was after a State of the Union address by former President Obama. And Jindal, who was governor in Louisiana, comes on to do the response. And he makes this statement, which I thought was a very glaring, telling statement. He says, the president wants you to believe that we are a country of have and have nots. We Republicans believe that we're a country of haves and those who hope to have. And that's the issue. That's the issue. People, they, they consciously delude people into, one, thinking that if I play it by the book, I can get ahead and I can get rich, even though I'm poor and I don't see any way out of this. Or they get people to look in the wrong direction. And that's the whole thing around racializing poverty, because you're not looking at what the real problems are. Well, one of the things I like about the Poor People's March is you focus on one of the key seats. You focus on Congress. Congress, 535 of them, as I say again and again on this program, can turn this country around. It can turn the public budgets around. It could crack down on corporate crime. It could deal with issues of peace, waging peace instead of waging war and draining our country and empire overseas. But the other focus should be the corporations. So it's, it's big business controlling our government and our Congress. And one thing I liked about Reverend Barber's speech at the Poor People's March, where you were at right next to him, is he's making this a moral issue. Right. It's got to be a moral issue. You know, all of these people profess Christianity, and they basically pursue and support the greediest and most corrupt politicians and corporate bosses. They support the present system. How can you be a Christian and do that? How do you deal with that hypocrisy as a reverend? Well, see, there, uh, theologically and historically, there's what I call empire Christianity, Christianity versus the Christianity that tries to speak to the human condition. And the empire Christianity is that which is represented by the evangelical community right now that basically cares nothing about morality, just want to basically apply their own sense of morality to everybody else in terms of abortion, around being anti-gay, all of those types of things, versus all of the rest of the folks who have sort of done the good work. One thing that's happening in the Poor People's Campaign is it's trying to recenter the discussion and to point out that the evangelical right, they are extremists. They do not reflect any of the principled values that exist in sacred scriptures. Notice I didn't just say the Bible, in sacred scripture. And on the other side, we have people that have been doing the work, feeding the hungry, caring for the poor, clothing the naked, visiting those in the jailhouse, but they have not necessarily seen what they have been doing as political work. And so this is a part of trying to re 
vision and get people to understand that the good that they have been doing in the community for the poor, for the sick, for the marginalized is political work, and we need to project our vision of a world in which everybody is protected and feels secure, that we deal with the issues of greed that creates the need in this culture, that we come back to that place where we understand that real, true human values is about sharing the resources and the abundance of the earth. And the Bible warned its adherents not to give too much power to the merchant class, because they knew that the commercial motive way back then oh, yeah. ran roughshod over moral values. By the way, every major religion warns us here it's not to give too much power to the merchant class. But isn't it true that the most frequent word in the Bible is poor or poverty? Poor, and also the issue around justice, mercy, compassion. Those are the words that continue to be spoken over and over again. And somehow we've forgotten each of those words. The reality is is that the religious extremists have avoided the texts and avoided the passages that calls them into a just obligation with your neighbor. And you know, they suffer too. Like they suffer from a pay-or-die economic system imposed on us by the giant drug companies. Where's the indignation here? That's the key to the poor people's campaign. The focus on Congress, the focus on these giant corporations, and a contagious moral indignation to get people out of their funk, out of their despair, out of their withdrawal, or if they're pretty well off in life, out of their cynical rationalization that things can't change in this country. It's a part of recentering the vision. The vision is not trying to simply get rich. The vision is trying to resource everybody so that everybody has some care, have support. I mean, just like right now, look at it. In D.C., the only true thing that you could say is affordable housing is public housing, but yet we have dismantled public housing. We have gone into the private sector. So you end up having homeless populations. You've got people sleeping in parks, in tents, all over the nation's capital that they're trying to hide from the public. They're trying to rout. That's going on not only here but all across the country because we have completely avoided the kind of economic issues that would resolve and some of the issues that are going on, such as around health care, such as around housing, such as around education and being able to afford it. I have a preacher friend that had to get a hip replacement the other week and working every day. I had insurance, but the reality is they end up after the hip replacement and with the insurance $25,000 $25,000 in debt, having to pay for it on time now, worried about how they're going to retire because they now got to pay for a hip replacement surgery because they couldn't walk, and they had insurance, but insurance only covered a bit of it. That's what's going on. That's a sin. We're running out of time, Reverend Hagler. How can people access the Poor People's Campaign on the Internet? They can go to poorpeoplescampaign.org and sign up and become involved there. That's one way in which you can become involved, and when you put in your name and your address, then basically the local manifestation of the Poor People's Campaign will be in touch with you and will notify folks about actions and gatherings and meetings and that type of stuff as we continue to try to build this. All over the country, too, right? All over the country. Every place we're talking about in the country, yes. That's called poorpeoplescampaign.org. Get involved, get connected, and get to a more just America. Thank you very much, Reverend Graylin Hagler. Thank you very much. Take care. We've been speaking to Reverend Graylin Hagler about the Poor People's Campaign. We will link to all his great work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Next up, we're going to be talking to conservative constitutional scholar Bruce Fine about Supreme Court Justice nominee Brett Kavanaugh. But well, right now, let's find out what our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber, is unearthing in the belly of the limited liability beast. You are listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Back after this. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, July 19, 2018. I'm Russell Mokhyber. West Virginia Attorney General Patrick Morrissey is running to unseat Senator Joe Manchin. Morrissey says no one in the state has done more to combat the state's rampant opioid epidemic than he has. But before becoming Attorney General, Morrissey was a lawyer and lobbyist in Washington, D.C., representing some of the same companies he would later sue as Attorney General. For example, in 2010 and 2011, Morrissey lobbied for the Healthcare Distribution Management Association 
the industry group representing pharmaceutical distributors including Cardinal Health, McKesson, and Amerisource Bergen. The group paid $250,000 for Morrissey's work over a 16-month period. Morrissey's wife, Denise Henry Morrissey, lobbied for Cardinal Health, the state's leading opioid supplier, from 1999 to 2016. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Now, last week, President Donald Trump nominated Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court seat vacated by Justice Anthony Kennedy, the seat that, if he is approved, conceivably could be occupied by Judge Kavanaugh for 35 or 40 years. Our next guest has some reservations about him. David? Bruce Fine is a constitutional scholar who was Associate Deputy Attorney General under President Ronald Reagan. Mr. Fine has been a visiting fellow for constitutional studies at the Heritage Foundation and an adjunct scholar at American Enterprise Institute. He has advised numerous countries on constitutional reform, including South Africa, Hungary, and Russia. He is also author of Constitutional Peril, The Life and Death Struggle for Our Constitution and Democracy, as well as American Empire Before the Fall. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Bruce Fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on, Bruce. Most people hear the words, he worked in the Reagan administration, he had a stint at the Heritage Foundation. You're in for a big shock, listeners, because Bruce Fine is what I call a constitutional transcendentalist. That is, he doesn't play favorites. He doesn't have a rigid ideology that biases his conclusions. He basically reveals an enormous amount of knowledge about constitutional law. And we're going to talk about President Trump's nominee to the Supreme Court, Brett Kavanaugh, a circuit court judge in Washington, D.C., And just when he was nominated, Bruce, it turns out he teaches a course part-time at Harvard Law School since 2008. And the law school put out a very, very praiseworthy press release on him saying how great he was at the law school with the students and so on and so forth. And no indication of the downside of Judge Kavanaugh, which is extremely fundamental. Take it from there, Bruce yes, Well, let, let me begin its background. I think most lay people don't understand that the Constitution is primarily a, a procedural document. Fair procedures is the cornerstone of, of civilization. Separation of powers, checks and balances. It's doing it according to the right process, with the right input, with the optimal way of diminishing the likelihood of tyranny. Indeed, The Constitution separation of powers has been described as a structural bill of rights to protect the American people from tyranny, which is why the Supreme Court has held one branch cannot constitutionally give away its powers to another. For example, when Congress attempted to give line item veto power to President Clinton, the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that because separation of powers, the cornerstone of our liberties, is something that's for the American people. It's not to vindicate the vanity of one branch's exercise of power. And what makes Mr. Kavanaugh's nomination, and I think this was true as Merrick Garland as well, is he, as well as Mr. Garland, and indeed most all of the recent appointees are creatures of the executive branch. They've been trained, they've been steeped in the idea that the executive is smart and wise and all power should be exercised by the executive. It may be begrudging Congress as little as possible They serve in the executive branch. All the law schools, Ralph, as far back as you and me, all teach executive branch hegemony. There's virtually no focus on the Congress of the United States, its importance in checking executive excesses, which are ever-present because of the incentive of the executive branch to concoct excuses for war or danger to aggrandize power. And we have not had a member on the United States Supreme Court with any legislative experience in the Congress for virtually a century. Hugo Black, who died in 1971, was the last person who served in the United States Congress as a senator, but he was appointed in 1937. So we have a court that over the last years, with rare exceptions, has continued to bow to executive branch supremacy. Uh, Most recently, I suppose, with the travel ban decision, 
by five to four. And before that, when Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion, denying the right of Congress to have a role in foreign affairs and prescribing Israel as a place of birth in a visa, a passport for parents who had a child born in Jerusalem. So, no, the president has to decide that. The Congress has no authority whatsoever. And it's also troubling that Despite the Supreme Court's decision, this one joined by Justice Kennedy, saying that detainees in Guantanamo Bay have a habeas corpus right to seek release based upon improper detention, that the Court of Appeals here in the District of Columbia Circuit, U.S. Court of Appeals, they have never once approved the release of a single Guantanamo Bay detainee since that decision called Boo Medien uh, almost That's 10 the years ago. That's the court that Judge Kavanaugh is, is on, yes. presently he said he's, uh, that is right. And one of the other judges who I worked for before his appointed, Larry Silberman, said there's no way we will ever permit anyone at Guantanamo Bay to be released. And so if you look at Judge Kavanaugh's opinions, they're highly deferential to the executive branch, except in, um, remarkably in regulatory cases where he backs away from his mentor, Justice Scalia's deference under the so-called Chevron Doctrine is more eager to second guess what regulators would do, at least in the name of benefiting the regulated, typically big business, I would call the, the, the corporate capitalist, if you will, the crony capitalist. But I actually had a case, Ralph, before him. It concerned the immunity of a head of state from being sued under the Torture Victims Protection Act for cruelly decapitating those who happened to be Hindu in Sri Lanka. And the executive branch came in and said, well, we get to decide on our own, whether you can sue a head of state. It, if it interferes with our foreign policy, we will instruct you as Article Three judges how to decide the case. This is uh, under what president? The, this was under President Obama. And this was, and the panel was Kavanaugh, it was Merrick Garland, and I forget who the third judge, and they wrote an opinion and said, that's right. Once the executive branch tells us to dismiss the case, that's what we have to do. I mean, it was re truly remarkable. And also what's troublesome about the U.S. Court of Appeals here, upon which Mr. Kavanaugh sits, is they now routinely, in these terrorism cases, they issue opinions that are mostly redacted. Now, Ralph, you and I would have been stunned if we were studying constitutional law and we looked up on our casebook, the Freud casebook or the others, and found an opinion redacted. That's what now goes on customarily in the U.S. Court of Appeals here. And who decides on the redaction? The judges? No. They give the opinions to the Justice Department to redact the parts that justice says needs to be classified. This is an extraordinary example, listeners. Law students go to law school and they read appellate decisions. And until recently, you would never see a redaction unless it was a pornographic word, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and now right. you see it all the time. And the judges are basically letting the president, the executive branch, decide which phrases in their own opinions that get published and for stare decisis are going to be blacked out, yeah, yeah, uh, are going you, to be uh, redacted. Uh, yeah, you, we have secret law. This goes back to Caligula, you know, putting the laws so high no one could read them so he could snare them into violation. The, as a lawyer, how would you know – You, as lawyers know, you argue cases. You try to distinguish your case from someone else by focusing on the facts. Well, if the facts are all redacted, how do you even try to argue your case should be distinguished? You don't well, even know a, what it is. Let's just look at the last three or so presidencies, and you can see that the executive branch has been engaging in secret wars, secret prisons, secret evidence, secret surveillance, secret appropriations, and you know just about everything contrary to open government – accountable government in defiance of the Congress, which doesn't like to uphold its own duties on the Constitution and is quite happy, majority of them, in shoving it over to the to the White House. So what would a Judge Kavanaugh, how would he vote on this? How would he vote it on the Iraq war, on the war on Libya, on drones going anywhere in the world? As a Supreme Court justice, would he defer to the president on all of these? He would either defer or, you know, the court characteristically in these situations concocts these excuses, political question, doctrine, standing, justiciability, and, and just like they refuse to handle the political gerrymandering cases, they throw it out. They just dodge. I mean, the fact is, even when we had people, Harlan Fistone in World War II, they actually took on the Japanese 
concentration camp cases and ruled in favor of the executive branch. We have not had ever really a court during a time of crisis when there's an ongoing actual or fictitious warfare stood up to the executive branch, except when we did have members of Congress who sat on the Supreme Court, Hugo Black. Hugo Black, I mentioned, is the last member who was on the Supreme Court, wrote the a majority opinion in Youngstown, Sheeton, to B. Sawyer, and he rebuked President Truman's seizure of the steel mills during the Korean War, despite Truman saying if their strikes will lack the steel to build our tanks and whatever. Uh, but it's notable that he actually had served in the Senate, so uh, he understood uh, the role of Congress. They said, well, Congress can authorize this. It has to. You know, if it's that important, you should be able to persuade a majority of the House and Senate. Uh, but I say we have these creatures, not only that they serve in the executive branch, but Ralph, I underscore, the law schools teach the deification of the president. You go to law school, you understand nothing about the legislative process. You understand nothing about the checks and balances, the far greater transparency in Congress and the differences because you have Republican and Democrats than what happens in the executive branch when it's a unitary government. You know, there's no dissent really permitted. Uh, all of it's secret, and so it's untested. Uh, tell and, uh, uh, Bruce, tell the story yeah. of uh, the national security aid to President Obama, Mr. Brennan speech at the Harvard Law School. Yeah. What he said, how he was received, as an example of what you're pointing out. This was in 2011. Right. And remember, John Brennan was, before he was appointed director of the Central Intelligence Agency, he was the deputy national security advisor. The reason why he was denied national security position, because even the Democrats and Republicans, they, they didn't think that he could escape the criticism because of his implication in the so-called torture techniques. We we call them waterboarding or otherwise, uh, techniques that both President Obama, who appointed him, and his attorney general, Eric Holder, described as torture, namely a felony, an international crime that can be prosecuted anywhere. So this is the gentleman that travels and, and receives a motorcade-type applause as he enters a Harvard Law School, probably coming up from Harvard Square is my guess. And he delivers this speech. He's trying to explain how the rule of law prevails in the Obama administration in selecting people to be vaporized by predator drones. He says, well, we are really careful. We don't want to kill anybody who's innocent. So we just look at the really bad guys. And only if we decide somebody's imminent danger to the national security do we kill them. And imminence, however, doesn't really have the meaning that an ordinary person would think it has. It's going to happen immediately, soon. They can have as a time frame as long as one or two years, like uh, Mr. Alaki being vaporized uh, two years after he's put on the hit list in Yemen. And then they vaporized his teenage son at dinner in Yemen also, the teenage son also being at dinner. He was not involved in any belligerent or terrorism activity as well, but you know, he was collateral damage, so to speak. And Mr. Brennan, he touts this as being celebratory of the rule of law. This is how the process works. The executive branch, on its own, without any outside review, decides whether somebody is an imminent danger to the United States. Now, do they tell you what components enter into that decision? No, because that's classified information. And based upon this untested, uncorroborated information, the president in secret decides whether to vaporize you with a predator drone. And that's called due process, he says, because we're really careful about who we kill. I mean, you know, George Orwell couldn't even thought this stuff up in 1984, man. That's due process. I mean, it's the very definition of what James Madison described as tyranny. You're combining the executive, legislative, and judicial functions all in one particular, not only one branch, in one particular person. In other words, uh, and, uh, the presidents are the prosecutors, the judges, the juries— yeah the executioners, and the cover-uppers. Yeah, you're right. And there's no question. You can't, you can't challenge the president. If you sue the president after the fact, like Mr. Alaki's father, they say, it's classified information. He goes into court and says, I want to know, on what basis did you decide? You know, my son was a terrorist. The U.S. citizen was a terrorist. So the United States response is classified. We can't tell you. Dismissed. State secret. It is a definition of tyranny that James Madison elaborated. It really yeah, is. It is. It is. 
I mean, which is why is, they were very careful about giving Congress the exclusive war declaring power, the exclusive appropriation power, among other powers, to try to make sure that we didn't get another tyrant like King George III. Our founding fathers are very, very clear about this. Well, back to Judge Brett Kavanaugh. Before he was a judge, in 1998, he wrote an article, a formal article, basically said that criminal investigations and prosecutions of the president should be deferred while he's in office. Congress should give back to the president the full power to act when he believes that a particular independent counsel is, quote, out to get him, unquote. So this has relevance today with the Mueller investigation. You think that was one reason that Donald Trump selected Judge Kavanaugh? Well, if I thought Mr. Trump actually read, I think I would say yes. I don't think Donald Trump reads anything, Ralph. And plus, the nomination, no for the, him as, as well as Gorsuch, a little odd because he's picking from the, the so-called Ivy Leagues. And, and Trump's base is not Ivy League based. In fact, it's the opposite. Indeed, if you went to Yale Law School where Mr. Kavanaugh graduated or Harvard Law School where he teaches now, I don't think you could find – even one member of the faculty, I don't, it may be a handful of students who would have voted for Mr. Trump. So, but I do think the people who were screening him, who really did the selection, was the Federal Society. They are the ones who promote this idea, so-called unitary executive and exaltation of, of the presidency, in part because they get handsome jobs when the guy wins the presidency, is the one that would have looked at this particular uh, Law Review article as favorable to to Mr. Kavanaugh because they do want an executive branch that limitless in its exercise of power because they want to be associated with an empire that rules the whole world. That's their mindset. And I do think that the Law Review article is, is quite concerning because it does display a complete disregard of the idea that the executive, more than any other branch, needs to be checked. I mean, what president wouldn't automatically say, whatever independent counsel is investigating me is a burr in my thigh, and I'm going to fire them? I mean, Nixon would have fired Archibald Cox in two seconds. He ultimately did, but he would have fired Leon Jaworski as well. Bill Clinton would have fired Karen Starr, and we know Mr. Mueller had been fired long ago. I mean, it takes a naivete of staggering proportions not to recognize that any president who's investigated for criminal activity would conclude and publicly pronounce them as being a nemesis who's unfair and is out to get them. We don't permit just trust me. We do the Reagan trust but verify, and verification comes from having somebody independently do the investigation, which was how Watergate uh, began. And that's not unique. We did Teapot Dome was with independent investigators too that were appointed by uh, President Coolidge to investigate the Teapot Dome scandal that implicated executive branch officials. But what is really is disturbing is that I believe the writing betrays this image of the president inflates his importance and preoccupation with serious matters of state beyond any recognition. I mean, he suggests that presidents are so wound up with the deliberative process and reading you know, philosophy and, and getting down to discovering facts and making these profound decisions that they have no time to respond to the allegations of wrongdoing. Now, th that description is, is utterly and completely absurd. Now, Ralph, both you and I lived through the Nixon impeachment investigation that ultimately came to a conclusion when he resigned. But that was for about a year and a half. And we didn't find any any fear that the United States government was going to fall or collapse because the president was spending time listening to tapes rather than worrying about the Italian lira or whatever. You know, the government went on. This was a year and a half. You know, and it was true. It was, and it, that was both the Cox investigation as well as Sam Irvin. We both lived through the Clinton invest. That was an impeachment. There was a trial. Okay, we we were able to survive. I don't know anybody said that there's certain work that was unfinished. We had unfinished symphonies all throughout these presidencies because they were subject to investigation, and in one case a resignation, another case impeachment. That's just silly. You know, it's honoring the rule of law who defines us as a people. The government is not the be all and end all of what our prosperity is about, our character as people. We comply voluntarily when we have the rule of law. And if we aren't strong enough to survive a president who is required, like other citizens, 
to respond to bona fide credible investigations, then we are no longer a government of laws where due process matters. And at well, that it looks point, like President Trump has picked someone out of central casting, Judge Brett Kavanaugh will very likely side with the executive and President Trump when the clash between the Mueller investigators and President Trump occurs, which can be right after Labor Day, and heads for the Supreme Court. So well, the the key issue right now is the quality and the scope of the Senate confirmation hearing on Judge Brent Kavanaugh that's coming up. It's important for people who have something to say and have a record behind it to apply to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Because, as you know, ever since the Bork hearings, the committee hearings have been very restrictive. They used to have critics on. Right now what they do is first they have the praise from other members of Congress and from the executive branch. Then they have a couple panels, maybe of law professors, who talk in very technical terms. And that's it. And it's very short. We want days of hearings. He has a huge record to put before the public. He was deeply involved in the Bush machinations in the post-election date in 2000 in Florida. He was deeply involved in that so-called recount. He was deeply involved in the Ken Starr investigation of Clinton and was a prime author of the Starr report. He was deeply involved in the Bush-Cheney administration. So he's not just a judge where you look at his past decisions. So we want many days of hearings and one way to increase the probabilities to have a lot of people who have a lot to say in one area after another about the propriety of him becoming a for-life judge on the Supreme Court, to ask Senator Grassley and the ranking minority, uh, Senator Feinstein, to testify. And I hope you do that. Now, Bruce, about this time in, in the interview, I'm sure some of our listeners are saying, Mr. Fine, please tell us how this can be turned around, step by step. Who are going to be in the vanguard? Is it going to be the law schools? Is it going to be the law professors? Is it going to be grassroots effort back in the congressional district? If you were running this turnaround so that we have a real rule of law, republic, and a democratic society, and we treat people fairly, and we advocate peace and justice abroad, all of which you've written about in your books and, and articles and op-eds, how would you propose the turnaround start, and who would be in the vanguard? Well, first, this is what the rules of the game are. They've changed since the Bork days, and we now have eliminated the filibuster for a Supreme Court nominee. So he just needs 50 votes plus one, and the vice president, Pence, could cast a deciding vote if there was a division. And at present, we've got 51 Republicans, 49 Democrats, but one of the Republicans, uh, John McCain, is ailing and may not be able to cast a vote. And at least on the Republican side, it would seem the two most likely to be flipped would be Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins. One is the former is from Alaska and the other from Maine because they're worried about Kavanaugh's willingness to uphold the core holding of Roe versus Wade, the constitutional right to an abortion subject to some limitations on regulation. And that's going to come about not by law professors, Ralph. It's got to come from constituents who write into their offices and say, you know, we can't support you for re-election unless you vote no, because this nominee is not someone who's consistent with what we think is an impartial understanding of, of constitutional law. That's true if, for every usurpation of our constitutional standards, right? Yes, whether it it's is. war, peace, right. whether it's... But, that's, that's what they care about. Well, it is true, Ralph, but I do think that there is a hierarchy of violations. I mean, to my view, war is stands at the apex of, of horrors because war, the definition of war is it legalizes first-degree murder. You can kill people intentionally, not in self-defense. In any other circumstances, you or I did that, we'd be prosecuted for first-degree murder. And so it is the horror of horrors. It takes our brains and our collective genius from production to killing. You know, we end up with a surveillance state, secrecy over transparency. It is truly, and that's where we're at. We're a perpetual warfare state. 
And we cannot survive as a republic unless this gets shifted around, because as long as the, the legal architecture, and we learn about that in law school, is war, the courts will never step in, except on you know occasionally, episodically, once every 10 years, and, and try to hold the hands and arrest the hands of the executive branch. We're lawless. And when you, and when you add nuclear arms and a one-man trigger in the White House? Yeah, it is. It, it's really stunning. I mean, we have these proposals. In, in Congress to, to say that the president needs congressional approval to use nukes. You don't need a statute. That's right in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11. It would be like, Ralph, Congress introducing legislation to say you have free speech. It's been there for 228 years in the United States Constitution. So what do you – I mean, it shows the mentality up there is already one that conceives the executive branch as a virtual god. I, it's, I, I mean, I, it's been a real counter-revolution it's in our lifetimes alone. From a time where when we were alive, when they rebuked Harry Truman over Korea to now, where the president is deified and kill anybody on the globe on his say-so alone and not be accountable for it. We have, ironically, Ralph, been able to become the safest country in the history of the world. We spend more on defense than the next 20 countries combined. We've got the best Army, Navy, Air Force. We have oceans on both sides. We have more nuclear weapons, more than anybody else, You know, nuclear submarines, aircraft carriers, and yet we act as though we're about ready to be thrown into the sea by teenagers throwing rocks in Mali or Niger and have military forces in 172 countries. And, and that's what the, the tyrants understand, that the human species is capable of being frightened at the drop of a feather if you put an initial you know, inflammatory rhetoric out there. And we have to guard ourselves against being duped by these people. Yeah, there are real dangers, but we have to put them in context and proportion. And this is the most important thing we have to remember, I believe, the cornerstone of our republic, the cornerstone of due process and the rule of law. It's a moral principle. It's better to be a risk being a victim of injustice than to be complicit in it. That one principle, better to risk being the victim of injustice than to be complicit in it, is what keeps our republic alive. Well, on that note, we're running out of time. Thank you very much, Bruce Fine. And listeners, if you want to watch Bruce Fine testify for the Senate Judiciary Committee, just contact Senator Charles Grassley, U.S. Senate, Washington, D.C. It's easy to get his phone number and tell them you want a variety of witnesses, including Bruce Fine, to testify on the nomination by President Trump of Judge Brent Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court of the United States. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you, Ralph. We've been speaking with constitutional scholar Bruce Fine. We will link to his work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. That's our show. I want to thank our guests again today, social justice advocate Reverend Graylin Hagler and constitutional scholar Bruce Fine. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. And for the listeners out there, please connect with the poorpeoplescampaign.org. Hi, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Welcome to The Wrap-Up. In this first section, we continue our discussion with Reverend Hagler. Let's hear from Steve and David. Are you morally indignant more than when you started this program? Yes, I, I definitely am. <laughs> Reverend Hagler, conservatives will tell you, like the late Charles Krauthammer, maybe Charles Murray, they'll tell you that the war on poverty didn't work. It was a failure. And that is their rationale for not supporting those programs or privatizing everything. Did the war on poverty work? The war on poverty did not work. It was sabotaged. And it was sabotaged one part of it. Remember talking about the welfare queen? Remember how folks talked about the welfare queen? As if somehow that was the length and breadth of those who were receiving aid. But again, it was sort of set up and characterized in order to dismantle it. And everything all along the way was an attempt to dismantle. Even now, we continue to deal with arguments over privatizing 
Social Security, for example, which is not a great resourcing of people in retirement, particularly working class people in retirement. But here we are again talking about privatizing that. We got health care. So all along the way, when we talk about basically what happened in terms of the initiatives towards eliminating poverty, it was sabotaged because somehow people felt that by so-called giving away something, you're depriving other people who worked hard for the something, which again is a part of the misnomer. It's a part of the miseducation and getting people looking in the wrong direction. I'm sorry, are you saying, Reverend, that the war on poverty failed in terms of what it was like for poor people before Lyndon Johnson and after? Aren't poor people better off now than they were before Lyndon Johnson? You have, in fact, more people in poverty today than you did when the war on poverty was announced. The war on poverty did help people here and there, but you're talking about the right. agriculture. Mean, remember this. Remember this. You seriously, you, you, you got working poor, and, and no one wants to ever count those in the whole thing of poverty. You got working poor. I, I'm doing organizing at the airport. I got folks who got two and three jobs earning $4 an hour. $4 an hour. Who can support their family on $4 an hour? Who live in the area but can't go home because they got to sleep at the airport in order to get to the other gig at the airport that's still only paying $4 an hour. I mean, those are the people that are not counted because they're employed. They're not considered poor. I mean, if you look at what who's and what is below the poverty line, you know, the reality is you realize that the numbers have not gotten any better. How do they pay $4 an hour? It's way under minimum wage. Because they write them up as tip wage employees. I'm sorry, as a Democrat, I fear that you're providing a Republican talking point, because I remember Bobby Kennedy saying bloated stomachs in Appalachia. I have trouble hearing that the war on poverty was a failure. I think there's a safety net now. Tell me where, where, where is food the stamps now, for example. There are 70 million people are on food stamps. Yeah, I mean, the war on poverty certainly helped people here and there. But I think what Reverend Hagler is saying is overall, David, the percentage of people in poverty now is as high or if not higher than before Lyndon Johnson. But clearly, you know, there were improvements here and there. But overall, it's still a very, very cruel place to grow up poor in the U.S. And, and, th and that's the catch word, Ralph, here and there, because the reality is every time there's been strides forward, there's been someone fighting to take it away and to basically remove a formula that has created some relief to people's lives. I remember when we were in Massachusetts, we were fighting over welfare. We were fighting over temporary aid to needy families. We were fighting constantly to just hold on to some subsistence and over and over again every single year without failure there was a battle to take it away and when we look around and we see the kinds of advances that were made i'll give you an example you know the attempt at affordable health care it did not go where it needed to go we needed to go to universal health care but we were there and from the beginning it was an attempt to take it away and uh, rather than to expand it and that's the problem is that we want to take it away rather than expand it rather than look at how we resource the lives of people and in a sense make the lives of people better also, David, the billions of dollars in budgets on the war of poverty, a lot of them went to gouging contractors who made a business out of poverty. Mr. Morris, who advised Clinton, wrote a book on this once. And also it was swollen by bureaucracies, self-sustaining bureaucracies. So there are various ways that it was sabotaged and discredited. And there are so many more efficient ways, and I thought I listed a few of them earlier by the various experts in this Washington Post article. And we're going to be talking more about, in this country, universal income, because as you get more automation and more employees being displaced by robots, even people in Silicon Valley are saying, you've got to have a universal basic income for everybody at about a $12,000 a year level. Okay, I'm just worried about semantics and framing and how liberals shoot themselves in the foot. And I'm a liberal Democrat, and I think to say that the war on poverty is a failure is like saying the New Deal was a failure or that the Civil Rights Acts of 64 and 65 were failures. They weren't failures. They were positive steps forward that, as the Reverend said, were sabotaged by the Republicans. But to say that the war on poverty was a failure, I think, is wrong, and it doesn't help our cause. It's too well, sweeping see, I think, a statement. 
I think the real issue becomes, though, is that we make these strides and we think that we have done it, and then folks begin to erode it, just like when we talk about the Voting Rights Act. In fact, there's less voting rights today than there was in 1968 or when it was passed in 1965. And even the fact is is that the other week when I got arrested on the steps praying in front of the Supreme Court, that the Supreme Court made the decision that Ohio could purge its voting rolls, which opens the door to every other state to follow a similar formula. And so, you know, you have poll tax previously that we fought to try to undo when we brought in the Voting Rights Act, and all along the way there's been a attempts to dismantle it, and it's gotten more and more successful in terms of dismantling parts of it to right now that when you look at the Voting Rights Act, it's literally been gutted, and the Justice Department is not doing anything to attempt to correct it or to hold anyone accountable to it. That's what I'm talking about, is that a part of the system is set up that you make one stride forward and five strides backwards. I think the takeaway from what you're saying, Reverend Hagler, is that we have these periods of great progress of the civil rights movement and the voting rights movement, for example, and then the oligarchy or plutocracy, they figure out how to game it. They figure out how to violate it, how to evade it, how to find new obstructions to repress voters that are proliferating around the country. And they do that with every advance. I mean, before people had the right to vote, people said, oh, if the people have the right to vote, then we're going to have a real functioning democracy. Well, look how they've gamed that with the corruption of money in politics. So it's the old story. Liberty and justice require eternal vigilance. And now Ralph talks about how corporatism also hurts the religious right. The reality is is that the religious extremists have avoided the text and avoided the passages that calls them into a just obligation with your neighbor. And you know, they suffer too. Like they suffer from a pay or die economic system imposed on us by the giant drug companies, the pharmaceutical companies. There was a segment recently on NPR where the people in Louisiana suffering from hepatitis C, there are about 85,000 cases of hepatitis C in Louisiana, very serious infection. And Gilead Sciences has come out with a drug, and I'm sure a lot of taxpayer R&D has gone into the precursors to that drug, that actually almost cures it. It saves lives. It's very Mm -hmm. effective. And they want $80,000 a year per patient from it. So the Louisiana officials are trying to negotiate a cosmic deal where they get so much money for so many prescriptions. But imagine the demeaning nature that our politicians place our country in. With these giant drug companies, they get incredible tax breaks. They get billions of dollars of free research and development resulting in drugs that make them billions, handed free to them from the National Institutes of Health and other government agencies. And they turn around and they import 80 percent of the ingredients in drugs from China and India, 60 percent of the drugs from China and India. There's no factory producing penicillin in this country. They're making enormous profits, and they're still telling the American people who are charged the highest drug prices in the world, that's what they get for subsidizing the drug research process in this country, they say, pay or die, and the Congress rolls over. And now here are some odds and ends we had to take out of the radio version of the Bruce Fine interview. The key issue right now is the quality and the scope of the Senate confirmation hearing on Judge Brent Kavanaugh that's coming up. I'm going to ask to testify, as I did in past nomination hearings with Judge Breyer at the time, and I want to talk about uh, how again and again Judge Kavanaugh sides with corporations when their interests clash against patients, against consumers, against workers, against labor unions that he favors big business. He is a corporatist, and he is one of the judges entrenching this corporate state, or what conservatives call crony capitalism or statism, in our country. I want to ask you, Bruce, do you want to testify? Are you going to ask to testify? Well, I have before. I don't know whether I would want to testify on the separation of powers issue. That's what I know backwards and forward and live through it for 50 years and see the whole, you know, the whole Constitution yeah. being warped from this. But the people who decide that, it's going to be Charles Grassley. I, you know, they'll decide on the witnesses. Uh, I probably will ask, but I don't know whether, given the biases and politicization of the whole process, 
whether they actually want to hear anything that's truthful as opposed to just those people will come and say, well, Mr. Kavanaugh, he loves his kids, and his kids are great, and he's he said nice things about his wife and about his mom and his dad, and that's great. I don't applaud him for that. Well, clearly, Judge Kavanaugh is a baseball fan. According to the <laughs> yeah. New York Times, he spent over $200,000 on tickets uh, over <laughs> yeah. the years to go to see the Nationals and yeah. give tickets to his friends. So he does have a light side to his personality, and I think he's going to try to charm the public and the Congress. You know, you have cruel people with smiles. We've seen that. You can make a list of leading politicians who say the cruelest things, but they it's with a smile. And then people just see the smile if they're not penetrating to the horror of some of the words that are being stated well, in somewhat that, that, that's uh, true, uh, technical but that's, that's, terms. But that's what our society is about. I, th- I think that in terms of, of politics, I think his statement was quite deft. You know, he made the right statements about the women and the girls and his mom and his dad, and he, he struggled, and he's he most important. He coached the women's basketball team. But that's what our culture fascinates about. You know, what's on Melania Trump's – what she writes on her jacket, and they have – I mean, how much have you read in New York Times, Washington Post – this is her coats or her skirts or whatever stuff, their fashion, you know, endlessly. And what that means, you know, why would you care? You wouldn't put in, you know, one sentence of this if you were a serious at all newspaper or reporter. Well, uh, but we, know, we're fascinated we're, about drivel. You know. No doubt. By this time, and running out of time, Bruce Fine, our listeners are having their appetite whetted for reading more of what you've written. Give us the title of your two books. Well, one is the most recent is American Empire Before the Fall, and it tries to identify. It's written several years ago, but I don't want to be vain here. But everything I prognosticated was going to get worse has happened in terms of extending our presidential wars from four or five into now nine, and goes through and it and, and focuses not only on constitutional law and the separation of powers and the, the violations that now have become so chronic, they almost become grandfathered in as part of our constitutional fabric, but also the obligation that we also have as citizens of the United States, as every bit as much as if we were serving in Congress or the executive branch to uphold and defend the Constitution. The major, I think, teaching for somebody who might want to read the books is, you know, the Constitution really is in the hands of American citizens. We have, in some sense, the highest office in the land, because if we don't insist that it be enforced, it won't be. We have to hold our members, these who represent us, accountable. To their and the other book? And the Constitutional Peril, the Life and Death Struggle of Our Democracy, it kind of recounts to how we got to where we are from 9-11 and the, the way in which we have succumbed to fear factors and inflating dangers, you know, 50-fold to justify taking the most drastic measures against really our fleas. I don't understand how these judges can call themselves originalists when it's so obvious that they are, you know, they're making kings. They're they're enabling kings. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, the ability of the human mind to deceive itself is infinite, (laughs) especially if it has a motive. (laughs) Yeah. They're corporatists. That's what they are. They believe in the corporate state. And all their so-called rationales and excuses and phrases like no standing to sue and this is a political issue we're not going to decide it when they know that a a cash register congress and a presidency are going to decide it i mean they know what they're doing it's all very very calculated the one thing about it is that they're totally predictable as a judge you're not supposed to be predictable but you know when it's going to be five four five four five four yeah And that's a wrap. Join us again next week when we take another deep dive into the issues that concern you most on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long.